today. It's good to be to be back at Union. Serene, um, thank you for your hospitality again. I was here uh, with with my wife and our baby, who is now the one who has given us a, a, a new baby in the family, um, way back in the in the late '80s. Um, and so uh, it is it is good to be back. Happy memories here. Also, I uh, have to. Uh, point out my protege over here, Isaac Sharp, was, was my student at Mercer and is having a great experience at Union too in the PhD program in ethics. So so we good to see good to see Isaac again. I'm going to um, today uh, you've got a handout. If you're watching this on live stream, you do not have a handout, you'll just have to listen um, and follow along. But um, I'm essentially presenting all over the country right now on this book called Changing Our Mind. And so the handout you have is the same hand, handout that I've been using at um, evangelical churches, um, evangelical colleges, um, uh, denominational gatherings. I've been tweaking it a little bit. but but So I, I, I want uh, to be consistent in my message regardless of where I go. Um, but being here at Union, Union is a part of the story in, um, in a kind of a complex way. And, and so uh, as I walk through some of this outline, um, I'll tell you about that. And I'll tell you about it in a, in a mode of, of uh, kind of repentance. Because that's, that's a lot of, of what is my own personal story behind this book. So basically, the headline that that people are taking away from what's going on with me in this book right now is I'm, I guess most people would say I'm one of the leading evangelical Christian ethicists in the country and I'm the first one to come out for full LGBT inclusion and acceptance um, without equivocation. Hello Jennifer, welcome. Um, yeah, so, so that was the headline and it, and it continues to be the headline. Uh, the evangelical community understood what I mean by that is um, theologically conservative Protestants of all types um, in general have set their face against um, any any kind of uh, full inclusion of LGBT people in, and in the, in the life of the church. And before that and even today, evangelicals have in many ways led the way in pushing against um, civil equality for LGBT people in the United States. So what you're talking about here is, is a community that increasingly has defined itself as uh, one of the, if not the, leading anti-LGBT force in the United States. And that's especially uh, painful um, if you are uh, an evangelical LGBT Christian, and there are many. Um, you might say that evangelicalism in the U.S. has in many ways de defined its identity, its public witness in American culture as, um, as the anti-gay religious community par excellence. And, and so when I decided uh, through a long journey that I was going to go in exactly the opposite direction, um, I knew that, that this would be seen as shocking on the part of many people in my community. Uh, but but because I felt led by God to do this and, and uh, have gotten there in good conscience, um, this is what I'm saying. And I want to explain to everybody that I talk to about this book kind of how I got there and what my arguments are. And I want to show that I remain an evangelical. Not that that word means as much to me as it once did. It's a word that has been damaged by politics especially. But you might say that the way that I reason is still shaped by 30 years as an evangelical Christian, meaning I think biblically, I think, um, I think in terms of major biblical categories, I take scripture seriously, um, I take the life of the church seriously. Um, and generally people who are hearing me talk about this book will say, well, I don't know if I agree with him, but I think he's still an evangelical, which, which helps, at least you can have a conversation with certain folks. So. Um, the first part of the, of the handout um, uh, talks uh, about, in an introductory way, every setting is different. There is hardly a setting in the United States Christian world where there is not some conversation about LGBT-related concerns, inclusion, 
um, welcome. Uh, even even you know mainline Christianity. It's hardly like mainline Christianity has gotten all of these issues resolved. Uh, every couple of years or every summer at some denominational meeting, there's some argument about ordination or marriage or something. Um, back over in the evangelical world, the argument is a little more basic than that. It's basically um, whether um, sexual and gender diversity can be accepted as a part of the creation that God made, whether uh, uh, people who are members of sexual and gender minorities uh, can be treated with equality, dignity, and, and be included in the life of the church on the same terms as everybody else. And that's way before you're talking about things like ordination or marriage. You're just talking about shared dignity, shared worth, um, uh, full acceptance on the same terms in the Christian community as anybody. Um, in a lot of evangelical settings, there are specific flashpoint things like maybe hiring policies or uh, student life policies or other kinds of things. Every place uh, is in its own discernment process. Change is happening. I was at a church uh, last weekend where the leadership team, uh, East Lake Community Church out in Seattle, where the leadership team has decided that they're going to be passionately and fully LGBT inclusive. And one of the speakers at that conference was the pastor of Grace Point Church in Nashville, another church where uh, on the basis of, you know, the discernment process of that pastor in that church, uh, they've decided to be LGBT inclusive. So, so that's happening in some churches, but these are still a small minority. Um, and in, in the colleges and seminaries and so on, these conversations are ongoing. So... I don't see union so much uh, as a context in which that discernment process is going on. Union has been committed to LGBT inclusion and to justice in this area for as long as I've known this institution. However, I do know that many students at union come from family and religious backgrounds in which that is not the shared commitment. And, um, and hopefully uh, some of you uh, will, will uh, return to these in, these communities and will be a voice and force for change. Um, a lot of what has happened um, on, on, that, on that front has been that you might say that evangelical Christianity, its churches and its families has exiled its own children. Um, a significant minority uh, exiled from their families, from their churches, from their denominations, and sometimes these exiles end up uh, at schools like Union um, because it's a safe place. Um, but my hope is for a social change movement within the churches in which exile is no longer necessary, in which exiles get to return home. Um, but that involves a theological rethinking process and a change of mind and heart. And that's the process that, that I, uh, I think needs to happen and is happening in a lot of settings. So my own story, um, I won't belabor, but essentially, I grew up Catholic. I converted um, to the Southern Baptist when I was 16 years old. Um, Southern Baptists knew how to evangelize uh, in 1978. It was before they were mainly known for political involvement. They were uh, Southern Baptists were about Billy Graham, you know, at that era. You know, they were about telling people about Jesus. So I was about as ripe a conversion target as I could possibly be in 1978. You know, I wandered into a Baptist church saying, do, can you help me figure out how to live my life? Four days later, I was a born-again Christian and um, became a Southern Baptist, and I've been a Baptist of various types ever since. Um, the, you know, the sexual ethics of a Southern Baptist church in 1978 were predictably traditional, um, and that that was all that I knew. And then I went to Southern Baptist Seminary, and it was the same. Um, and then when I came to Union in 1987, I encountered a much more open and diverse environment. And I wasn't able to process it in 1987 as a 25-year-old. I now know that. Um, uh, the change was too dramatic from where I had come from. And, um, and so basically I bracketed it. I said, okay, I'm at Union. They're more inclusive here. That's interesting. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to keep my head down and work on my, my dissertation. You know. <clears throat> so, so that's pretty much what happened. Um, and 
And there's a lesson in that, not that I'm proud of it, but the lesson is that for some people out of traditional backgrounds, the very idea of a fully inclusive Christian community is a shock. They've never encountered it. They've, they don't come from that kind of environment, and they're not ready. And I really wasn't ready, so I just basically bracketed and said, I'm just going to continue to do my work. Um, and then my first teaching job, the only job I could get in 1993, took me right back to Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. That was what was available. And I was a compromise candidate between the, the warring conservatives or fundamentalists and moderately conservative people were basically the options, right? So, so I was, I was uh, somebody they could hire. And so for the three years that I taught there, I taught sexual ethics as just a small piece of the ethics survey class. My dissertation was on the Holocaust. My emphasis was on other, other issues, um, human rights issues and so on. And I was young. So I, I, when I did my basic treatment of sexual ethics, I just took the traditional line. Um, and I now realize that I took the traditional line without a whole lot of thought and with, without a whole lot of um, sensitivity to who might have been in the room. And that I was not informed by personal contact and conversation with LGBTQ people. Of course, that wasn't even the language in 1993, was it, right? But at least, it, you know, and so, and that's still true today. There are many, many uh, people who stand up and either write or, or, uh, or teach about LGBT issues, straight men often, who do so entirely uninformed by actual contact with LGBT people. Partly because they've created religious worlds in which it's not safe to be an LGBT person, so you're never going to actually know anybody. And then they can, they, they can just kind of spout whatever they want to say, um, and then never have to get challenged, and never have to learn anything from, from uh, contrary voices. That's what a lot of religious America is like. Does that make sense? Um, and so uh, uh, kind of a, a basic uh, lesson from that is never talk about the ethical lives of a group of people that you don't know anything about. Good general principle. Um, uh, so I learned that. Um, when I moved to Mercer University in 2007, uh, after, uh, as, so now I'm 14 years into my career, I've done a lot of writing by now, I've written a Christian ethics textbook called Kingdom Ethics, that's widely used by this point, translated into many languages, um, getting some reputation in the field. I also had gotten involved in the anti-torture fight uh, after 9-11, was, was well known for that progressive cause, pretty progressive, the United States shouldn't torture people, crazy stuff, I know. Um, um, so I, I, I moved to Atlanta in 2007, and now the veil of ignorance related to LGBT people gets pierced. Uh, and it began in my local church. Decatur, Georgia has a very large LGBT population, and that's where we went to church. We went to the First Baptist Church of Decatur, Georgia. And um, I arrived uh, about the same time as our wonderful pastor, Julie Pennington Russell, who was a pioneer in her own sense. There are not too many senior pastor women in the, in the Baptist world in the South, or really anywhere, but especially in the South. So kind of in the wake of Julie's arrival, um, our church began attracting first a trickle and then a flood of LGBT Christians. And um, it wasn't like there was a, a program to do so. It was just a church that was um, friendly, and uh, people in the community couldn't miss it. It was on the corner there where you could all see it, and people, people coming, and then it became a friendly and a welcoming environment, and then no doctrinal issue or conversation, just welcoming the human beings who were coming our way. So we, we have been on a journey over these seven or eight years. I remember specific milestones, you know, like... Um, I remember when a lesbian couple with an adopted daughter were wanting to join as a family. And you know in a lot of churches that would be hugely controversial, even today. And there are various kinds of fictional devices that churches use to kind of keep the don't ask, don't tell going for a while longer, like one week one of the people joins, and the next week the other member of the couple joins. And then a child just kind of wanders down, you know, whatever, and oh, all of a sudden you have a family, you know. Um, so, but this, this couple, this family did not want to play that game, and, and so said, can we join as a family? And 
And it it would have been out of character for our church to say, no, pretend you're something different. So they joined as a family. And they were welcome. They were scared. Would we be welcome? They were welcome. And it's just kind of, you know, eventually, uh, you know, we go from a few families to 5%, 10%. I'd say maybe 15% of our members are now LGBTQ. And, um, and, And it's a safe place to be that. And, you know, one of the things I've learned is all over America, you have an underground of people who were raised in Baptist and other kind of evangelical environments who got forced out or really felt like they had to leave for their own safety, their own mental health or spiritual health. And when they discovered that there's a church that sings the hymns they like and preaches the way they like and teaches the Bible the way they like, um, that is safe, they come back. And that's what's happened at our church. And I've been, a number of us, have been transformed by the encounter with the dignity, the faith, the devotion, and the suffering of the LGBT Christians who've come into our community. Um, And I would say my best friend in Atlanta right now is uh, is, uh, a man I call in the handout here, T.S. Um, He's gay, he's, he's deeply devoted to his partner. Um, and he comes from a fundamentalist Baptist background. And he told me a story uh, about his, his journey that really was transformative for me. He said that when he came out in his 30s, his, his very large family, except for one or two uh, of the eight people in his family, rejected him utterly. Not an unusual story. And um, his father was the worst. His father was a pastor. When his father was dying in the hospital, T.S., he felt like he wanted to go say goodbye. His father had banned any contact for a long time. But T.S. decided, I think I should go try it. I need to say goodbye to my father. He got to the, uh, to the door of the hospital room, um, and the family was gathered around. And um, he was standing outside. He didn't dare to go in because his father had not allowed a relationship. One of the siblings said, Dad, you know, T.S. is here to see you. And, and the dad, from the hospital bed, the last thing he ever said to his son was, I don't have a son by that name. And what, and as, as uh, my friend wept telling me the story over breakfast at IHOP, I believe it was, um, and I realized, this is sick. This is sick religion that does this. And you know that there's a, there's a kind of a, a problem when the more devout you are in a particular tradition, the more likely you are to have contempt for a group of people that you've been taught to have contempt for in the devotion of your tradition. And that did connect to something I had learned at Union, and that was about anti-Semitism. In the history of Christianity, up until the shock and horror of the Holocaust, and especially doctrinal change that the Catholic Church led in the 60s, the more devout you were in large parts of Europe especially, and also in the US, the more you were taught to have contempt for Jewish people. Because after all, the Jewish people had killed Jesus, and after all, um, uh, and so on. And there were biblical passages you could cite, plenty of them. And And so when religious devotion is associated with forming people into contempt for another group of people, you've got a toxic thing going on. And, you know, uh, there are other strands of Christianity that have done the same thing on race and on gender and on, on other dimensions. So I just, I began especially through this friendship with T.S. and then um, in the experiences I was having with seminarians who were perfectly gifted but were being blocked from ordination because they were uh, gay or lesbian. Um, then my own sister Katie coming out as a lesbian um, in her late 30s. And one piece of her story after a lot of psychological struggle and suicidal attempts and so on, she said that one reason it took her so long to come out was because her brother was a Baptist minister. And she was concerned that our dear, close relationship would be affected. And I thought, hey, doofus, you know, you are complicit in a religious tradition that is hurting people. And 
you're a leading Christian ethicist, and it's about time you, you do something about this. It helped that Mitchell Gold, who wrote the book Crisis, which he's, he's, um, he's a businessman, a philanthropist now, um, gay, from an Orthodox Jewish tradition, he came to see me in Atlanta. He made a special trip to come see me in Atlanta. I didn't know him. He said, can we get together? I said, sure. He said, I'm working on this book which tells the stories of 40 uh, LGBT people raised in conservative religious America, Jewish, Mormon, Catholic, and uh, evangelical. And, um, and I'd like for you to read this manuscript and tell me what you think. So I did. Um, and he said, I wonder if you would now consider coming out as our ally. And I said, uh, this was like 2010 maybe. I said, I I'm not quite ready to do that. So in the conclusion of his book, he called me out as a bystander. He said, Dr. Gushy, who's written this great book about rescuers and bystanders during, during the Holocaust as being a bystander on, on the LGBT issue. It's about time for him to get off the sidelines and get in the game. It's good to have friends like that who call you out in print, you know? <laughs> that was good. Um, I would say on the whole, I'm just outlining some of the experiences I had. I, I mentioned in the outline, students from my former Baptist schools writing me saying, um, I loved everything you taught except for one the few things you said about uh, homosexuality because I was in the room and you didn't know I was in the room and I was closeted and it hurt me and I wish you'd rethink that, you know. Um, that was all coming. Um, but just as uh, not having direct contact with LGBT people helped to inform my ignorance, having all of these experiences with and not just experiences with deep personal friendships and relationships with um, LGBT Christians in their suffering and in their dignity, in their alienation from the church, but also their hanging in there with the church, was decisive for me. My heart broke, my loyalty shifted, and my sense of obligation to use whatever platform I had accrued in evangelical Christianity to turn, to turn the tide on this if I could contribute to that became decisive. So in 2013, 2014, I, I worked on a book that eventually became this book called Changing Our Mind. Hello, live stream audience, here it is. Um, and I, the, way I, the way I presented this was in a series of essays in the Baptist media called the Baptist News Global. One essay a week. Um, and eventually pulled them together into this collection and added some things and that became the book. And so the book is essentially uh, written using the tools of scholarship but written for er anybody. It's written for that teenager who's wondering about their sexuality. It's written for the mom who has just heard, um, you know, my child is gay, what do I do? It's written for the youth minister who's Think of how many ill-informed youth ministers are responsible for the care of souls of young people um, in our churches, right? It's written for that person. It's written for the pastor. Um, and the book is being widely read, and it's, it's bouncing around a lot. Um, and so the, the, let me just kind of walk through the basic structure of the argument. Um, I start off by saying, the church today has a serious problem with, for lack of a better phrase, the LGBT issue. And I don't like that phrase because LGBT people are not issues, they're persons, right? But anyway, the church has a problem here, and it's hurting us. It's hurting the reputation of Christianity. Um, it's hurting our persona in the world. It's hurting our mission, and it's hurting people, lots of people. In my world in particular, my particular religious subculture, denominationally, the preference is to not talk about it. I call the not talking about it option the avoiders. Maybe you come from an environment where if it's at all possible, people will avoid talking about the issues here. On the other side, then you have the traditionalists who, who hold on to, the, to traditional um, Christian exclusion of LGBT people on the basis of a reading of sexual ethics, which is based on a reading of Bible passages. And then I said there are people who are revising um, this approach to come to a new approach. And so those are the three basic options. I, I frame this issue as essentially that 
Christian understandings of sexuality are being challenged and in some cases reevaluated, mainly due to evidence offered in the lives of those who do not fit the historic heteronormative kind of framework. And, but it's, so it's people's lives and not just anecdotes, it's a large body of research and, and uh, mental health clinicians and you know, psychiatric and psychological associations and so on. Um, and the persistence, despite every kind of persecution of a sexual and gender uh, minority of about 5%, maybe more, uh, maybe less, um, is a fact in the world. It's a fact in the world that Christians have had a very hard time coming to terms with because of a theological framework that does not accept this fact in the world. Um, LG, the existence of LGBT people is a problem for a certain kind of theological framework, an inconvenient fact. And what people have done with this inconvenient fact is all kinds of fruitless and harmful direct interventions. Everything from, um, okay, and I, where I'm most, I mean, I'm a, I'm a dad and I'm a grandfather now. I'm most affected personally by family stories, and there's lots of them. They're everywhere. You know, 13-year-old, you know, dad, I think I might be gay. You know, reactions ranging everywhere from beatings to um, exorcisms to uh, nicer, but we're now going to do everything we can to change you, to help you change yourself. And um, the, the, uh, the, the birth and growth of a quasi-therapeutic uh, approach in the ex-gay reparative therapy thing. Everywhere I go, I run into people who have been subjected or have subjected themselves to uh, reparative therapy, which is basically an effort to um, reorient people's sexual orientation, sometimes with dramatically negative consequences. The whole thing has been, has been discredited, um, and, um, and yet, the theological pressure to create a world in which there's nobody of same-sex orientation remains so strong that people still sometimes resort to some version of reparative or ex-gay, um, even though no scientific or medical association supports it. Um, meanwhile, as I said, that you know we have to face the fact that the Christ Christians have have been the most uh, vocal force resisting the most basic gay rights activism since the since the 70s. It's Christians who, like uh, Anita Bryant down in Florida, um, and others who who uh, have treated uh, the cry of LGBT people for equality and dignity and employment rights and civil rights and just the end of contempt. It is Christians, mainly evangelicals and others, who have dug in their heels and said this is a threat to family values and to traditional uh, Christianity and we must fight it. In general, that effort has failed. And so we're on the cusp today, I think, of national gay marriage and, and there are gains in many other arenas. And so as Christians have fallen back in defeat in some of these civil, civil struggles, the fights are now located almost entirely in the churches fights over inclusion and over justice and welcome. Um, and there, the fights remain strong. Um, and to some extent, there's still efforts to stop gay civil rights, though I think those are, are fading. A lot of talk about religious liberty as well on the evangelical side um, as a kind of a fallback. We can't win, but at least maybe we can protect our rights as we understand it. I, I called every reader to to um, some mandatory minimums. I said to every reader, no matter who they were in the evangelical community, accept the existence of a human population of sexual and gender minorities. Accept that a significant number of, of sexual and gender minority people are Christians. They believe in Jesus. They do everything that you could call a Christian a, a Christian. And so how dare you deny the existence of gay Christians? I said, it's time to end any tolerance for slurs, derogatory statements, or bullying, which still regularly happens from pulpits and in Sunday school classes and so on. 
I said it's time for us to get off of the battle against uh, gay civil rights, um, regardless of your theological beliefs. It's, it's not doing anybody any good. Um, zero contempt for violence, zero contempt for stigma, zero, zero, zero uh, uh, tolerance, I mean, for any of that. That's what I said. And I tried to, to create some space for Christians to open their doors in welcome to LGBT people, even without having resolved all the theological issues that people think are there. I said that in many churches, the overall posture when somebody wants to join is, a, hey, we don't ask any questions. We're just glad you're here. Well, that should be applied to everybody. Or um, a posture of humility and gratitude. We don't judge. We just welcome. Um, I said that some churches, when, it, when, when, um, when LGBT people come to join a church um, or even to visit, it creates a, a need for dialogue about issues that people have not talked about yet. So have the conversation, but do it right. Um, I said the time has passed where it could ever be acceptable just simply to exclude gay people from church membership, but some churches do still do that. But I said what, what the, the need of the hour really is for, is for some normative reconsideration. I asked, are you willing to go with me to revisit what you thought was settled in the Bible and reconsider um, what still most evangelicals consider a settled matter, which is some claim like this. The Bible doesn't speak about same-sex activities much, but when it does, it speaks negatively, and that's all you need to know. And so I, I then said, if you'll go with me into this, let's actually look at the text. So I went through the major texts, the Sodom and Gomorrah story, the Leviticus passages, what's going on in 1 Corinthians and 1 Timothy, and, and uh, Genesis 1 through 3, what do we make of the creation narratives? And then finally, the Romans 1 passage, which I think is the single most important one in terms of creating um, what many people find in the evangelical world to be uh, a theological blockage that they can't get past. I actually think that and I'll be happy to dialogue with you about any of these specific passages, but my overall take, and I look at them very closely in the book, is a lot of evangelical Christians have not, have not been trained to, to read um, not just texts but context, uh, have not thought about what is going on in the ancient Near East or in the Greco-Roman world related to sexuality. They have no expertise on that at all. Mostly they don't know any Greek or Hebrew. All they have is an English translation of a Bible and um, a plain sense reading of a few passages without nuance, without context, and without an awareness of what those passages sound like if you're on the receiving end of them. I've concluded that the big six clobber passages are actually a fairly thin basis to, ex to exclude an entire population of people from the grace of God. But then we're going to need more than that. We're going to need more than knocking down those six passages. We need um, to draw on the broader resources of Scripture for, for example, and I think a key paradigm shift here is, is looking at the moment when an early Jewish Christian movement realized the Gentiles were going to be the recipients of God's grace too. And um, that, that we're in a parallel moment now. Um, and Paul himself, though he left us a time bomb in Romans 1, um, has plenty of writings that are about the astonishing discovery that people you thought could not be the recipients of God's grace and could not be part of the family of faith are indeed the part of the family of faith. So the Gentile Jew issue in the New Testament I think is important. But I, I realize that every major theme that I've worked on in my ethics calls for inclusion and equality um, human dignity, the sacred worth of the person, each and every person, justice, human rights, solidarity with the oppressed, liberation, um, and most notably, what Jesus was about in his own ministry. You know, it's hard to, to immerse in the gospel accounts of Jesus' ministry and see him as the kind of Messiah who would create a church that teaches contempt for any population of people. 
So my conclusion on a Christ-centered reading of Scripture is that we got it wrong. We got it wrong for a long time. We got it wrong because we didn't understand sexual orientation. We got it wrong because we did not allow the broader themes of Scripture to inform our reading of the entire Scripture. And getting it wrong, we have reproduced a context for the harming of an entire population of people. Um, and the details are in the book, and I'm happy to dialogue with you about it. But since the book came out, I have learned a lot. I have learned that the damage is worse than I knew. I've heard from hundreds and hundreds of mainly LGBT people telling me their stories on Facebook and other environments. Um, I've learned there's a basic script that essentially goes like this. Young person discovers they're gay or transgender or whatever. Parents freak out. Young person, and that's a long struggle, young person and parents wrestle psychological challenges, mental health problems, sometimes homelessness, exile, family rejection, and maybe in some cases transformation happens on all sides and everybody is able to accept who everybody is. <laughs> um, but all too often it doesn't go that way. So I've joined with the Family Acceptance Project as a faith consultant to help them. What they do is analyze the impact of family responses to uh, LGBT young people. And they have documented that the more rejecting a family is, the more problems an LGBT young person has. It's just direct correlation. For example, the most highly rejecting families, in those families, kids are eight times more likely to attempt suicide. Um, six times more likely to be depressed. Uh, three times more likely to abuse drugs. Um, and so, I'm, wor I'm actually last Saturday I heard at the session that I was at in Seattle, we heard from the parents, evangelical Christian parents, like a million of them, 10 million of them, who had a gay son who couldn't accept himself, they couldn't quite accept him, he ended up getting involved in serious drug and alcohol abuse and died at, I think, 19 or 20. And this, like, out of the pain of this couple, they stood in front of this entire audience with pictures of their son on the screen behind them, basically saying, don't do to, to your children what we did to ours. Imagine if that's what your message is for the rest of your adult life. Um, there's, there are methodological issues here in terms of theology. Like, can we ever learn from human experience? Does human suffering matter? I know people in my world who are there like, you're just confusing the matter. All we got is this, that's all you need. You tell me about children suffering, you're just manipulating my emotions. And I say, no, human suffering is part of the data of theology. And But here, the liberation and justice-oriented strands of a place like Union become really, really important. Because this place has been taking human suffering seriously for a long time. But God did before that, too, so it's not just Union. So. I have heard their cries, Exodus 3. I have heard the cries of my people in their distress, and I have come down to deliver them. Our God is a God who hears the cries of the distressed and the oppressed. This is a form of oppression. I see it now. What's really sad is it is, a, in some cases, it's a form of kind of self-imposed oppression. Um, in the sense that where LGBT people are raised in environments where they are taught to oppress themselves. And then they, they do that until finally they reach a breaking point where they can't do it anymore. I'd like to help create an evangelical Christian subculture in which we didn't do this to people anymore. And so that's what the book is about. Um, I do realize that this issue raises other issues that are important for theological education, handling of scripture, integration of a broader and more sophisticated methodology of how you discern something morally, um, a broader theology of the body, theology of sexuality, relationality. Um, a lot of the passages that are used to bang people over the head actually can be used constructively, like Genesis 1 and 2. Um, is a clobber passage sometimes, but it also, if you read it more broadly, it's about how we're created uh, with dignity in the image of God, 
created um, uh, with a need uh, for relationality, uh, with a desire to find um, uh, uh, many of us at least a helper partner to be with. Um, um, we are both independent and also dependent alone and also uh, needing not to be alone, not good to be alone. There's a lot in the passages of the Bible uh, that can inform a richer theology, but not if they're just used as clobber passages. Um, so so I, um, I am in the fight uh, as an ally, very deeply inspired by, by the leadership being offered, especially by young LGBT Christians themselves. Uh, people like Matthew Vines out of Wichita, Kansas, um, Justin Lee from the Gay Christian Network, Jennifer Knapp, um, and, and a, a host of others, um, people in various places wrestling with their sexuality in various ways and having to do it in public to help the broader evangelical community figure out what to, what to do and how to change. This is a major social change movement of our time. In the civil arena, there's still more to be done, though a lot has been accomplished. Where the actual fight is, is it's a kind of a house-to-house, -house, church to church fight. And, um, and I feel like that's what I've been called to, and that's why I wrote this book. So I guess that's where I'll stop today, and I'll be happy to take any questions that you have. So thank you for coming out today. Yeah. yeah.